Aloha, and welcome back to a very special session of Talk Story with John Waihe'e. Boy, have we got an interesting show for you this afternoon. Now, there are going to be a couple of differences from our normal uh, format. First of all, our show today will last for an hour because of the wealth of information that we will be discussing. Our show will be obviously Heroes, Rascals, and Duds, and they involve all of us talking, gossiping maybe, about all the various people who made Hawaii what it is today in one way or another. And the second difference in format is going to be the fact that I will be a guest on my own show. And we are going to have a special guest Host. So this afternoon, our host will be Colin Moore, who is in head of the Dean of the Public Policy uh, Institute or, or, or at the University of Hawaii. Colin, you can, you know, clarify the uh, director the close, close enough, Governor. I'm happy that, to be here. Director. And in addition to that, as, an, as, a, as a, we have a guest, so Richard Bereka. Richard Baraka, probably, I, I refer to him as the pundit of political commentators in Hawaii today because he's the only person that is actively involved in the media who would actually recall some of the instances, incidences <laughs> that I may discuss uh, this afternoon. And obviously, uh, my last guest would be Chuck. Freeman or Charles Freeman. Chuck has been around the political, well, he's been around everywhere, starting from um, the Big Island and coming to the state of Hawaii, worked with Gene King, worked for me, and is a first communications guru. So, exciting show. Don't let me take up any more time. Colin, the micro, as they say, the microphone belongs to you. Terrific. I'm excited to be a guest host. This is going to be a terrific show. So like the governor said, we're going to go for an hour, um, discuss a lot of the people who shaped modern Hawaii, and we're going to talk about them as heroes, some rascals, and some duds. We've got so much ground to cover that we're going to move roughly from state, statehood era to the present. We're not going to be too disciplined about that, but we're going to start with some of the early folks and try to move our way to the present, talking in all of these eras about who were the heroes, who are the rascals? Who are the duds? And I think in some cases, there are folks who were heroes, rascals, and duds um, all at once or at various times over their career. So Richard, I'm going to start with you because you just wrote a column about Dickie Wong, who just passed away at 88, and whose career really spanned a period of tr transition here in, in Hawaii. He was first elected in 1966 and later moved to the Senate. And then held the Senate presidency, I think, for what is still the, the longest record from 79 to 92. So could you talk a little bit about Dickie Wong? First, was he a hero, a rascal, or a dud? And, and what makes him so unique? Well, I think that for, first off, he was he was two of the three. He certainly wasn't a dud. He was a, a very strong leader. He started out uh, as uh, sort of the Hawaii prototypical liberal in the in the state house um, where he represented the uh, Kalihi area and then uh, he was a strong union member with uh, United Public Workers and held an office with the UPW and which sort of burnished his his liberal qualifications but then it's soon became apparent that this was a guy who knew how to organize and get people together and get them talking and uh, get them talking. Usually it was about how Dickie Wong could uh, probably be an, a, a leader. And so that's what he did in, this, in, in the state house. And then when he moved to the Senate, uh, Dickie, quickly became the Ways and Means Chair of the Senate. And I remember that uh, one of the interesting things was that he was really showed himself as a people person. Uh, there was, at that time, Hawaii didn't have very much money, was uh, always having budget cuts. 
the University of Hawaii was having big campaigns, big demonstrations down at the Rotunda at the state capitol. And Dickey was uh, Ways and Means chairman. And instead of having just protesters there, what Dickey did was he said, you all come into the Ways and Means office, if not stay out on the, on the lanai. But let me explain the budget to you. And he went in detail through the budget. And I don't think if he may not have convinced everyone, but he did an amazing job of uh, getting that uh, in, in, in forward. From there, uh, he used the ways and means to gather more of his own uh, power and became Senate president. And he was a Senate president who, as I said in my column, he could always count to 13, which is how many votes you need to organize the state Senate. And he was always able to do that. Then uh, he became a quite powerful, but he also knew how to share that power, which was uh, for legislative leaders is very difficult to do, but a good one knows how to parcel it around and still be able to crack the whip when you have to. But Dickey wanted more than that. Dickey wanted also um, a seat on the Bishop of State, which at that time was the most powerful uh, position in, in Hawaii. Um, and he kept telling me, he says, I'm going to be Bishop of State trustee someday. And sure enough, he was. That then became part of his downfall where um, he, I think he, re he reached for too much, grabbed too much, and uh, wound up with uh, uh, attorney general investigations following him around. Uh, when he left office uh, and became a Bishop of State trustee, it, it was not a good time for him. Bishop of State was very controversial, and much of it was because of Dickie Wong. So it was a, it was certainly wasn't a flame out. It was a, it was a steady march up to the top, and then a uh, quick uh, tumbling down from there. And, and you mentioned that he knew how to count votes, but he did some somewhat made some controversial decisions to keep his Senate presidency, including working with Republicans, right? Oh, yes. I mean, that was one of the things that he, uh, people may not understand that the, we, the Republican Party at that time was much stronger. They had 16 senators. Uh, than it is now, and uh, I mean, you really picked sides, and you uh, you would fight over that, and that was one of the things that happened uh, with with Dickey. Is he to organize Senate? He he had to also uh, take in the Republicans. Doing that, one of the things he did is that he one of his buddies was uh, sent at that time state senator Neil Abercrombie. And he had to take Neil Abercrombie's committee, his uh, higher education committee, away from him, and gave gave him uh, lower ed. But he wanted he was he was the darling of the University of Hawaii, and to have him lose his higher ed committee committee was a big deal for him. And that's one of the things that that uh, happened, uh, and it was because of what Dickie Wong needed to do to keep his I, organization I, 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 solid. I think that the uh, I think. Uh... Oh, if I mean, I think that the the uh, insight to all of that was that the people that he kicked out of power mm -hmm. were were the were his supporters. He, he actually came over to the Senate with uh, being supported with the likes of Neil Abercrombie, Ben Cayetano, uh, Duke Kawasaki, and the other so-called progressives. And when they got into the Senate, and at one point, I guess what happened was they were trying to undo his organization. And basically he went over to his friend, which tells you a little bit about the collegiality that existed in those days. With, by the way, uh, there were eight, I think, Republican uh, senators. And went over and made a coalition with five Democrats and basically uh, kicked out the guys who brought him over and uh, you know strengthened his his uh, his uh, his uh, position. I just want to, you know, add on to that. I don't want to kill Dickie Wong. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a terrible thing to say. I don't want to kill the discussion on Dickie Wong, but um, I want to point out that Dickie had a way of making friends and 
doing what he needed to do, and uh, even with people that he opposed. Dickie Wong opposed my election two times, including in the Demo in the general election when I was the Democratic nominee. He supported the same person he made a coalition with, which was the Andy Anderson. But immediately after I got elected, we spent, uh, he and I essentially worked everything out and he was, a, a, you know, I consider him one of the foundations of anything that I got accomplished, including uh, when, we, when we sat down and actually had a conversation, I told him, Dickie, you never got along with a democratic governor, which is Governor Ariyoshi before this. So, uh, you know, uh, what, what is it gonna take for you and I to build a better Hawaii? And he said two things, you know, he said, Governor, what I want to do is I want to uh, build housing. And the villages of Kapolei and all of our housing programs would not have been possible without the strong support of the Senate, number one. And number two, he said, just to show you how the practical guy he was, and I want a library for the people in Salt Lake that I've been trying to get every year for years, I've been funding that project and the prior governor would never release the money. You know, and so, it, which brings us to another guy that was a part of that era. Don, which is a real, one, one, one quick concluding story about Dickey. I once, at, at the height of his power, when he was really controlling a lot, I asked him in a private moment what it took to really be Senate president. And he looked at me with a sort of quizzical eyebrow look on his face and said, Chuck, it's 90% social work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He said, uh, he always said, I was, I'm, a, I'm a social worker. That's what I do. But his, you know, it, it's really funny because on the other side of the legislature doing that early period were, uh, was, a, was a speaker, Henry Peters. Mm -hmm who was also a very, a very strong uh, leader and a governor, uh, Governor Ariyoshi. And the politics of those days basically saw those two individuals uh, kind of alive. And, uh, and before, uh, before Henry Peters, another strong uh, leader, uh, Jimmy Wakatsuki, mm -hmm. who uh, ended up on, in the Supreme Court. Uh, as you can see, just by the politics of all of this, since the governor appoints, uh, you know, uh, Supreme Court uh, justice. So Dickey's era was a very, very interesting political era. And as you know, uh, following Richard's story about Dickey, Henry Peters also goes from the, uh, right. the state legislature into the bishop estate and the controversy that evolves goes involves a third person who we already mentioned, the governor at the time where, that investigated the bishop estate, which included these two gentlemen as trustees, was uh, was uh, Ben Cayetano. And Ben, any one of these guys are in their own right, uh, probably a little bit of all of them. Uh, you know, a little bit of each of the uh, definitions. I mean, they definitely all contributed to making Hawaii uh, a special place. They were all rascals in a certain sense at some point. I mean, Henry, Henry, <laughs> Henry not only used political power to get people in line, he used, you know, Henry was a big, tough guy and uh, he, you know, he don't want to mess around with him. And what, then what? there was George. Let me ask you about another group of folks who also were quite powerful during this period, but they weren't elected officials. And here I want to talk about organized labor, which has always played such an important role in Hawaii. And I'll just throw a few names out here, um, you know, and, and anyone can react if they want to talk about it. I'm thinking here of David Trask, uh, um, Aquan um, McElwraith, um, even Jack Hall, that's a little bit early. Um, how how did the labor leaders interact with the politicians in this period? And and were they all heroes or were they rascals too? Well, Chuck, you haven't said anything. <laughs> well, I, my sense of the, there's really quite a variety in the names you just rolled out. I think the prototype 
for, for relatively speaking, heroic leadership from a union, and it's not totally heroic because some of it's pretty gritty and dirty, was, was Tommy Trask. I mean, he was, uh, to me, the, the model for it all because he kept his dignity and you knew when you talked to him, if you shook his hand, uh, you had a deal. There were all sorts of variations beyond that and some union leaders who, who failed to meet the call, including Gary Rodriguez, who was a terrific guy on the one hand, but ended up going to jail for his, for his crimes. Um, but to me, it's really hard to pick out one that, uh, one that stood that much above the others, I, I think Tommy in my mind did. Richard? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, because uh, labor, labor itself uh, was about the specific issues of each uh, union and each, uh, if, if it were the, the unions that represented um, public workers, uh, you had a, uh, a group of unions that were more together than not, but even then they had their own issues. And so they, they had a hard time getting together. I remember when I was uh, covering the legislature early on, how shocked I was that labor for so many different things could not get together. Uh, it, it was not a specific bargaining unit issue, but minimum wage uh, had the hardest time uh, getting uh, heard by uh, committees that touched on, on, on labor. It wasn't, it wasn't the same deal. Minimum wage and, and labor issues were completely different. Um, it, 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 labor being more along raising the standard of living for everyone as opposed to one specific group. Um, there were other, other parts of labor, however, that strayed far and away from just uh, wages and salaries and benefits. And that was just the sheer power that labor had uh, in the legislature and to an extent still does. There are always going to be a group of uh, uh, legislators who are owing more to labor than to anything else and they get their jobs. Uh, they get their reelections accomplished uh, through their support of labor, and that's that's a, a specific issue that that uh, the public should uh, understand more. I would think. I I, I think that the one underrated person, I mean, frankly, that was sort of with labor, but more than labor that you mentioned, on was uh, Aquan Mechera, and she. Yeah, she was in a category by herself. I mean, her origin uh, were with the ILWU and organizing plantation workers, which at that time, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about Hawaii's history is how the plantation borrowed the tactics from slavery of the South to implement the program here in, in uh, Hawaii. And Aquan was uh, obviously in, in when she was uh, in beginning was a was a force uh, organizing labor and getting them to understand it. But as the years went by and labor became more institutionalized, Aquan never gave up that fight. I mean, she was always on the side, whether labor was with her or not. In fact, uh, there were times when, or as Richard mentioned, regarding the minimum wage when uh, labor actually saw it to their advantage not to have a minimum wage pass because it would help them facilitate organizing. And, and John, she really up. fought to her last breath. I mean, oh, she, to the, last breath. the longevity of her, her, her leadership is unchallengeable. I, I think one of the things that I find interesting is that all the young women today who see uh, uh, Patsy Mink, right. Congresswoman Patsy Mink, as their role model, uh, not realizing that Aquan was Patsy Mink's idol, mentor, the person she wanted to be like. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, I, in my book, uh, you know, she, I wouldn't consider her anything but a hero. So let, you just mentioned Patsy Mink, and I know, Chuck, you wanted to talk about Patsy Mink, and I think she's probably pretty clearly a hero. Um, and her career spans such a long period of time. Any, any highlights 
in your mind about what makes her so heroic? Yeah, and I know Richard wanted to chime in too. I mean, she was third generation uh, AJA from Maui. Uh, after, after college, she wanted to go to medical school, but they weren't taking Asian American women into medical school. So she went to law school and got a law degree and then they wouldn't let her, t- let her take the bar exam. I mean, she was fighting from, from the get go. Uh, got into local politics and then was eventually, I think, in uh, 1964, elected as the U.S. Congresswoman from Hawaii and became the first, not only Japanese American. Seven, Seventy-four, Joe. Sixty-four. Sixty-four. I'm sorry, but... Sixty-four. To the House of Representatives. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. you're in state, so this, state this, house. I'm sorry. Anyway, and became the first Asian female American in the United States House, and then, and then uh, also the first person of, of color. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that stands out to all the things she did in fighting against the war in Vietnam, and always on the side of the poor and the underrepresented, uh, underrepresented, is that 1972 she co-authored the Title IX of the Civil Rights Act, of the United States Civil Rights Act, which basically prohibited gender discrimination. Uh, in any college or university receiving federal money. That's a lot of gobbledygook, but what it did is it totally opened up women's athletics, changed the face of how, of what kind of opportunity women's had, women had, changed the way we looked at not just women's sports, but women in this country and internationally. And ultimately that particular, that particular um, uh, Title IX amendment was renamed, and I have it in 2002, Title IX, Patsy T. Mink, Equal Opportunity and Education Act. She was a force of nature and a remarkable person. And really, to me, if I had to pick an all-time hero in modern Hawaii, uh, she was it. I also got to go to lunch with her a few times. She had a great sense of humor, uh, self-deprecating as well. And um, it was just a, a, a wonderful person to be with. Uh, Richard, you have something more? If I could, uh, if I could yeah, uh, go ahead, Richard. offer a little bit more on, on um, Patsy Mink. One of the parts of her history that is not very well remembered, but should be because it was straight out pol- uh, politics. And that was when she was uh, council, council chair. Uh, and at that time, uh, she, she was on the mainland and Three members of the city council switched parties, George Akahani, uh, Taraki Matsumoto, and Rudy Picaro suddenly decided that they were going to be, that they were actually Republicans. And this was a deal to get uh, more power at City Hall, which was then controlled with Fosse. And uh, Patsy Mink hopped on a plane, flew back to Hawaii, and was in, immediately started a campaign to have all three of those people not thrown out of the Democratic Party, to have a special election held to throw them out of the city council. And who knew that what happened? It actually did. She caused an election to be held, and all three of them lost their seats on the city council because of what Patsy Mink did how outraged she was that they switched from Democrat to Republican. So there's, that's a, a, a lot of clout she had that you don't really appreciate until unless you were uh, Picaro or Akahani. Since, since we're on the subject of influential and heroic women, Governor, I wanted to ask you about someone who I know uh, you worked with in the 78 Con Con, and that's Auntie Frenchie DeSoto. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, and you know, Auntie Fran- I actually knew Auntie French because she was a community advocate on the Waianae Coast. And she, <laughs> this is a, you know, strange, uh, teaches you a little bit about uh, working in the community. And I was then working uh, for Frank Fossey. And my job was to do, uh, you know, programs uh, on the Waianae Coast. And Frenchie Frenchie was one of the community, uh, community participants. And she, uh, we got to know each other because she she issued a complaint about uh, Henry Peters, who was also working uh, for Frank Fossey on the Hawaiian Coast, and saying that you know there were 
that they that he was that the, that the little group there was a little group running a, a, anything blah 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 and uh and immediately uh <laughs> and i went in there to evaluate the situation and then she got to like uh, henry peter and so i found myself the evaluator was in the corner i was there to help Frank french because frenchy had a way of uh Frenchie, you know, Frenchie was, first of all, everything that you saw. She was a loving kupuna. She was, uh, you know, completely dedicated to making Hawaii better and Hawaiian cause. But un underneath all of that, Auntie Frenchie was a very skillful political mm. operator. And she knew how to do it. In fact, at one of my first Democratic conventions in Hawaii, I remember I forgot my badge. And I, nobody was letting me into the room. And Auntie Frenchie said, oh, poor boy, here, take one of mine. And she had about a dozen, you know. I mean, this was a woman. So along the way, she became a member of the Protect Kaha'olabi Hana. And up until then, Auntie Frenchie was basically, you know, wanting to do see how the political system could work for Y and I, poor people. And, and, and she got a real interest in protecting the ohana and she began to began to be uh, use all of her leadership skills to you know keep the group together and help the people who were involved people with names like walter reddy who is still around today and uh Ahmed aluli who is a doctor on, on molokai and starting to not only mentor these individuals but actually work with them and a young guy named John Waihei, you know, <laughs> pulling it into her web and, and keeping it up. So Anti Frenchie and I both got elected to the 1978 Constitutional Convention. And she uh, she and I went through an organizational phase. Anyway, she ends up being chairman of the Hawaiian Affairs Committee. And one of the most interesting things she ever uh, she did was she then reached out and hired on her staff, all the people, the leaders that were protesting something in the state of Hawaii, and basically said, if you guys got a solution to the problems that you're identifying, what are they? And if you, uh, I, I, I don't want to take up a whole bunch of time, but to really get to see what that meant was that if you read the uh, Hawaiian Affairs uh, sections of the Hawaii State Constitution, Every one of those articles came from a specific Hawaiian activist group. And so she was able to put all of this together. She had this unique talent of assistance. Now, you got to remember that there were only like four Native Hawaiians on Native Hawaiian committee, maybe five. And she, and out of 30 members, and yet she was able to. Uh, sit down and uh, every one of the proposals passed unanimously. So that, that to That's, me, that took a real talent. She uh, was, you know, totally grassroots, totally oriented to her community. And, and a deal maker too. Yeah, and, you know, people had a way of misjudging her. They thought she was just some, um, you know, activist off the Waianae coast. No, anti Frenchie, uh, in fact, Anti Frenchie was a group of Hawaiian women across the Oahu who were all skilled politicians and, and uh, people like Paula Coutre, people like uh, 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 Sister Correa, people like all of these women who knew how to use political power at the grassroots level. So with that, economy. we're supposed to take a we're supposed to take a five minute break, but we'll be we'll be right back. Well, no, one, one minute break, I think. A one minute break. Excuse me. One minute break. So don't wait long. We'll be right back. Hello, my name is Kathleen Lee, owner of Kathleen Lee Consulting and host of Think Tech Hawaii's Connecting Hawaii Business Program, aired every other Wednesday at 2 p.m. In this show, we highlight business and community leaders in the Aloha State. So we thank Jay Fidel and the staff at Think Tech Hawaii for making programs like ours possible. Aloha.
welcome back to a talk story with John Waihe. I'm obviously not John Waihe. I'm filling in for him as the co-host because the governor is a guest today. Um, and we're talking about uh, heroes, rascals, and duds, people who shaped Hawaii politics. And we talked about a lot of heroes in the first segment. And we're going to take a, uh, a minute to talk about some rascals. Um, and I want to talk about one of the chief rascals, in fact, someone whose tagline was Hawaii's favorite rascal. And that is uh, Sam Amalu. Um, Chuck, do you want to start us off? Well, he he, uh, he was a remarkable man. He 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 used a synonym uh, or not synonyms, various names for himself. He called himself uh, the Indian Maharaja. He called himself a banker, <laughs> Albert Wilcox. I think his most most famous of his of his fraudulent type deals was announcing the purchase of five shirt and properties for $34 million back in, I think, 1962. And it sounded it was like one of been the biggest deal in Hawaii that there ever was, except for one thing. There wasn't any money. It was a complete hoax. Um, and, you know, sometimes this stuff was really fraudulent. And sometimes he would just say, it's just a prank. What's everybody all excited about? He, he ended up in, in Folsom Prison, of all places. I didn't realize that until I looked it up. And that's when he started writing his columns for the Star Advertiser. And they were wonderful, grassroots, meaty kind at of- At that crazy. time, it was just the, it was, it was just the uh, advertiser. I'm the sorry, Honolulu I said the Star Advertiser. advertiser. Yeah, the the, there, there used to be two, two papers in, in yeah. town. And, I'm sorry. And, uh, Sa Let me just Sammy Amalo had a great relationship with, uh, with the publisher at that time, and uh, he got a column out of it. The column was stopped because uh, people protested to the then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, that a prisoner should not be allowed to write columns. And then the Hawaii public, in turn, protested that he should be allowed. And Reagan uh, uh, let him start writing again. And uh, he, he was writing he was writing columns when I was here, and I didn't get here till 1972. I don't know any other. I didn't actually know him. Of all these people we've talked about, I at least knew them. I, I never met him. Maybe somebody else has something to add. I, I, well, I didn't know him either, but I love reading his columns, and I I love the idea of reading his columns. You know, right. they, we we had a bunch of, of people like that. I mean, Chuck, uh, you you I, I, um, you remember Ron Rewald, right? Why don't you tell the Rewald? Yeah, he was he was no, a he, real rascal at best, a, a rascal. Well, well, he was more than he was more than a rat. He was more than a rascal. He yeah. was if you, if you, I, I and Barbara Tanabe were the people who broke the Rewald story. And I remember being in an investor's house the day after the story broke, and I was interviewing him about uh, what happened. And he was just ashen because he's his wife was trying to take on the money that they had in stocks that suddenly had disappeared because uh, Rewald, the fictitious accounts, the, their money had been invested in essentially fictitious accounts. It was a Ponzi scheme that he had uh, going. It, it was it was just appalling some of the stuff that, that he did, uh, the money he took from people. Do you remember the so name of the a, firm, Richard? It, it, Bishop, it Baldwin, was, Rewald, Rewald, Bishop Baldwin Rewald, Rewald, Dillingham. Bishop Baldwin Rewald. Bishop Baldwin, yes. Rewald, Dillingham, and Wall. But none of those people except for him you were. You know, he, he really, he came through town on a whirlwind, though. He really duped a lot of people. And I think that- Including uh, for a time, even the, C, even the CIA was uh, for a while um, duped in, into thinking that he had some clout. Uh, and the closest he ever got to it was to be on the greeting line for, I believe it was George, uh, George Bush, uh, no, Henry Walker Bush, the, the first one, uh, that he uh, actually was part of, the, part of the receiving line for that. And uh, he had a very low, low profile place in, in the Central Intelligence Agency. Most, and, but from that, he was able to trade himself up as being a... Uh, uh, a, a big Akamai person within you know, central federal government, which of course none of that was true. It was all con. Let me. Yeah, uh, and I think that he used the he, he, his entree 
into Hawaii was the fact that he uh, a sponsor of polo. And he oh, sponsored yes. the polo games out at Mokulia. And as a result, he, he constantly had these associations with the uh, rich and famous that played polo. And I, I, I remember when I was in office, um, I, um, I didn't want to talk to him. I was already getting suspicious of, of, of some of the mm -hmm. things. And I don't know why, but I said, I actually sent Chuck. I said, Chuck, there's this guy, Riwa, wants to do something for Hawaii. You go talk to him. I, I don't want to go. He was lieutenant governor then. He didn't want to talk to him. So I went over to see Ron Riewald, Ron Riewald in his office, and he gave me the storm and drong. And I went back to the <laughs> lieutenant governor and said, you know, I, I can't say that there's anything fraudulent here, but there's something wrong with all this. And the lieutenant governor told me, well, you better report it to the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, which is what we did. Uh, that was in 1983. And Richard, by, you know, by the, I think by the end of 83, he had already spun out, tried to commit suicide. He made Barbara Tanabe famous because Channel 2 kept saying that Barbara Tanabe broke the story and they were pushing Barbara as, as, as a, the first uh, female anchor. And it, so every time I saw Barbara after that, I would go, and she broke the Rewald story and she would laugh. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he flamed out pretty quick, but he, he goes sort of beyond rascal. He well, was a, I, 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 that so I, I didn't want to yes. meet him, but then I get a chance to actually meet him. So one day I'm sitting in my office as Lieutenant Governor wondering what I'm going to do just to make sure I can check out at five and it's like, uh, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, which is what Lieutenant Governors do in the state of Hawaii. So anyway, uh, you know, I get a call from, this is, I get a call from Jean Ariyoshi. And Jeannie tells me, she says, I'm having this very important lunch today at Washington Place, and the governor can't make it. Governor can't make it. And uh, uh, can you come over as lieutenant governor and, and fill in for him? I said, wow, I've been waiting for to do something for, you know, Governor Ariyoshi, because she's not the easiest person to you know, hand uh, delegate the activities to. So I, I go over there and this is a lunch that she's been, she's putting on for the Sultan of Brunei and the Crown Prince of Brunei. And they show up and they're here to play polo and following them into the room was also this guy, Ron Rewal. So I finally get to meet him sort of and he's sitting at the other side of the table. And the luncheon begins, you know, uh, with the, the, well, there's two, two little side stories. There are two little faux pas that drove for the first lady crazy, you know. The first thing was that the, the crown prince of Brunei shows up with two wives, mm -hmm. not one. And they had to immediately reset the table according to some kind of protocol, right? <laughs> and the second thing was after giving strict instruction, to the chef that the that these people are, are Muslim and they can't eat any pork. The chef prepares uh, tenderloin steaks for lunch wrapped in bacon. <laughs> 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 and if you know anything about the genie as a first lady, uh, she was like the ultimate hostess and this was like totally ruining. By the way, Richard, I think wrote this, sort of wrote this story in passing in one of your articles about how uh, Ariyoshi had the uh, rewall over to Washington Place. In hindsight, I think George uh, Ari didn't show up for that luncheon because he didn't want to be with rewall, not, you know, not just duck. And I was too naive not to know, but it was, uh, that's a rewall story. L let me as ask I, you. As I remember, I was going to say, as I remember the, uh, uh, when I was working then at Channel 2 with uh, Barbara, that uh, when we were looking through clips of uh, Rewald, some of the stuff we found was with uh, Ariyoshi, and there were several, several different parties where I think Rewald managed to worm his way into gubernatorial receptions, and he's clinking champagne glasses. I don't remember pictures of uh, the first lady with Jeannie Ariyoshi there, but uh, the governor there uh, and, and Rewald. But it, for him, it, it was, uh, he was able, he was a 
total chameleon. He could yeah. slip himself into any group of people and pretty soon be the one telling all the jokes and being the the good buddy to everyone. Uh, it was a remarkable con act that he was able to go on with. But be, as I said, it was a Ponzi scheme and Ponzi schemes don't last. And and he was quickly running out of money when uh, the, it was the state. Uh, we got our hands on the first investigations that the state was doing and were able to uh, broadcast that. And then his uh, little empire collapsed and uh, he uh, had an attempted suicide. And we were very suspicious about it at the time, about whether it was uh, really whether or not it, it was it, for more for sympathy or for he was actually trying to kill himself. I think it was a very minor wound he had on his wrist. Uh, but he soon was uh, in jail from the whole thing. Let me let me ask you about a, a dud. And it really, I think this is one of the more tragic figures of, of Hawaii politics. And, and, and that's Milton Holt, um, you know, who had the quarterback of the Harvard football team had this meteoric rise in politics early and then um, a really tragic collapse. Um, what what do you think was behind that, or how well did any of you know know him? I, I, I knew I knew Milton obviously, and he was. Uh, we served together in the sense that uh, uh, when I was in the House, he had gotten elected to the mm -hmm. Senate. His career began with a, you know, with a big bang because in order to win the seat in the Senate, he had to upset one of Dickie Wong's uh, closest associates, T.C. Yim. T.C. Yim was a longtime mm -hmm. very good campaign, a good senator, and uh, Milton got elected by beating T.C. Yim in, in his district. And, and you know, he, he, he was a star, and he, it was going up, and at that time, one of the experiences I had with Milton was uh, deciding which one of us was going to run for lieutenant governor. Uh, who, I wanted to run for the office, and he was toying with it, and he, and he was in the Senate. And so we uh, he, <laughs> we did one of Milton's seances. You know, he took me down to this bar in Kakaako, and uh, bar steakhouse place, and uh, you know, we spent like three hours. And he finally told me that he wasn't going to run for the uh, lieutenant governor. But to give you some of his skills, not only did he keep me there for that time, he also made me pick up the check. <laughs> you know, but but I got to tell you, he uh, and because I, I worked with, him, and it is a tragic story how his career ended because, quite frankly, uh, he was one of the smartest uh, politicians I ever worked. And I worked with a lot of smart ones in, in terms of knowing the process, in terms of knowing the process, knowing how to get things done and, and why. Um, yeah, it, it, it was Hawaii's law when, when he uh, tragically had to leave the, 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 uh, the Senate. Well, it, it, it was, he had, he, uh had a lot of devils chasing him around, I think. And I always found it to be so fascinating because the Holt name is such a famous name uh, in Hawaii history. I think it's, I think, although I haven't been to the newly remodeled Bishop Museum, but the Bishop Museum used to have an entire section on the Holt family and going back through. So there was like a whole cubicle just to the Holtz and uh, their impact on Hawaii. And so to have uh, Milton uh, so uh, tragically out and, and have so many problems uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 was, it was more than just, just uh, the indictments of than that. I think he had a, a lot of other problems that, he sort of set the uh, land speed record for drinking during the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Uh, I think it was one of his first arrests, uh, but you know, it was a lot of problems. 
Who who else who else is on your mind? I I can go on. I have lots of names. I can think of a, a rascal for sure, someone who was very influential, um, and we, who I haven't talked about yet. And that's that's Frank Fossey. Oh, Frank! I, I gotta mm. tell you, I, Frank is Frank is one of my favorite people. I, I mean, really. And first of all, I worked with him. And to you know what he what he he's sort of a he was kind of a Donald Trump with a lot of class. I, I don't know how else to do it. I mean, just to modernize the, the image of him in the sense that, that Frank, um, uh, you know, Frank, Frank, first of all, loved his job, which makes him a little, maybe a little bit different than the Republicans today. He loved being there. Uh, he, uh, he liked doing things for people. I mean, he was, you know, in many respects, a classic Democrat. He was, uh, and I have so many Frank Frosty stories, but, uh, you know, but uh, 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 along the way, uh, well, not only I worked for him, but then I, I also, he, I was the only Democratic governor candidate in uh, the, uh, doing the era that he was around, which he didn't run again. We didn't run because we sort of developed this relationship and we developed it really around building houses. The villages of Kapu, Kapule, the Kapule and the Ever Villages was between Frank and I was a little contest of seeing who could build more houses quicker, you know, and extract more from the Japanese investors than, than others have done. And, 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 and Frank was totally, and then, but then we got to the point though, he changed party. And when he changed parties, he was going to run uh, for against. Uh, well, he changed parties, and he was starting to run run for re-election at, at city hall as a Republican. So I asked uh, my communications director, Mr. Chuck Friedman, to you know put a speech together for me to give at the Democratic Party convention. And Chuck thought about this great line, talking about how uh, we need to take the folly out of Honolulu folly. And, and I used it. I used it in the speech out there and I, I immediately get a phone call and there is one really angry Frank Foss. <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you mean? You know? And so we, you know, we had a little ups and downs, but uh, you know, rapid transit, all of that. The, I, I don't know how to talk about, it, but you know, the plus about Frank Foss was that he, in many respects, was ahead of his time. I mean, Frank, wanted to build a mass transit system in the 70s and the 80s. And he was, uh, he along with myself, visited Washington DC to get the people on board, starting with the uh, Bush administration and, and get the funding for doing it, all of that. And on the, on the other hand, he alienated, he alienated the city council, so we have to constantly count votes to could barely get them to do it. And they didn't. Have, they they rejected it. Yeah. Well, yeah. they rejected it with one of the duds and wrestled with the remark. But you want, yeah, the thing you have to remember about Frank Fossey in context, and he was a very creative, bright guy, and 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 kind of fun to get to know, is when and I don't think it was partisan so much as. He just didn't like Ariyoshi and Ariyoshi's people. And he didn't <laughs> like them because in his mind, they just weren't doing enough. They had all this power. Here I am, this little mayor, the governor, governor Ariyoshi has all this power, all this money, he just isn't doing the job. So Frank took it upon himself personally to vex the Ariyoshi administration at every turn. It was, you know, he, he wouldn't miss an opportunity. When Waihei got elected governor, uh, there was immediately detente in part because uh, Governor Waihei knew Frank. He had worked for him. Yeah, for plus, I like hired half of his cabinet. Yeah, that's right. It, 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 Frank's former managing director became your director of transportation. Ed, uh, Ed uh, his last name. Hirata. Hirata. And uh, so it, it, it all, the, the, the game changed. And we actually had a, a pretty good relationship between state and county that, for the years at Waihei. But the other side of Frank Fossey was he banded Rich Barreca from going into his press conference. That's what we need to talk about. That uh, was you got banned, so Richard? That's true. That's, happened, that's Richard? true. In fact, the uh, Barreca v. Fossey is uh, case law for the report, a reporter's 
ability to go into a news conference. Uh, I was banned from his news conference. I had written a lot of stories about them. I mean, uh, the, Frank Fossey was the mayor. He was never an angel. Uh, and I had a lot of stories that, that explained that. Uh, he had the fire department uh, inspectors would go and inspect uh, different restaurants and businesses. And while they were inspecting them, they also had uh, birthday tickets that they passed <laughs> out and hoped to sell to his fundraisers. Uh, so he was he he was not like angelic. Uh, <laughs> no, no. So stories that was one of the many 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 stories uh, Dave Shapiro and I wrote about uh, Frank Fossey um, that were 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 not showing him in a good light, uh, and I was banned from City Hall for that, um, and it went on and on. Finally, uh, the Star Star Bulletin. Uh, sued him in federal court, and Sam King um, was the judge and upheld uh, uh, the, I believe it was uh, TRO, uh, saying that I was allowed back into into City Hall, and uh, that's how I uh, went from covering City Hall to covering the state capitol. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we have five minutes left. So this is the lightning round, and we'll just end with. If each of you, and I'll call on you in order, could give me one name and identify them as a, as a hero, a rascal, or a dud, um, and just 30 seconds to one minute about, about why, why they are who they are. Um, and Chuck, I'll, I'll start with you. Okay, um, I'll take a rascal, Mayor Tony Kunimura. Mm. The state <laughs> legislature, he was, he was and is beloved. There is a statue of him uh, on Kauai. Uh, he, he used to have he had fist fights with fellow legislators. Uh, he was he had a lot of power. He was a you know kind of tough bulldoggy looking guy, um, but he was also a devil. Uh, I remember one hearing where uh, finance committee hearing where Nelson Doy, Lieutenant Governor Nelson Doy, walked into the room, and and uh, Tony stood up and went ten hut, and and everybody looked what was he going a little silence and finally said well after all he is a lieutenant. <laughs> that, that's, that's the kind of thing he would do. He also, at the end of finance, Jerry Burris remembers that at the end of finance committee, when at the very crunching end of budget, he would get in his chair with wheels on it and roll himself up and down the aisles uh, of, of the, the, the third floor uh, singing. And why exactly? To distract people or to, who knows? But that's the kind of crazy guy he was. And one day he asked Jerry Burris, he asked Jerry after the budget was in, did you get the whoops? And Jerry goes, what do you mean did I get the whoops? And he says, well, in every budget we put in one thing that's just flat out wrong. So that if we have to call everybody back together to do the budget, <laughs> we have a reason to do it. But if it goes through, nothing will happen. So did you get the whoops? That was That's Tony. great. <laughs> Richard. Well, I, I was going to say, I don't know how remember, remembered he is now, but uh, one of the characters of City Hall back then was uh, Councilman Frank Liu. Uh, he, he had a lot of different things. Many people remember him when he campaigned was that he always managed to break a leg. Uh, and... <laughs> People suspected that these this was just a lot of bandage literally his leg. But he campaigned on crutches. He would he would campaign on, on crutches and they would also be in his some of his campaign ads would be the crutches where he would be limping up through his campaign district, uh walking the district. But uh of, of all all those, probably was the most famous thing was send uh Frank Liu went during a city council hearing when he was demonstrating uh, the effectiveness of pepper spray. And this, he kept saying, no, 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 it's not that they won't, they won't do anything. Won't do. So this woman sprayed him and sprayed him so much that he, he lost it and attacked her. <laughs> and it wound up both of them on television wrestling on the floor. 
uh, of a city council meeting. Uh, <laughs> that, so that, that's that my is memories of one of, that one of the terrific. biggest characters. Governor, you have the last two and a half minutes. Well, I, I tell you what, I'm going to pick a couple of heroes actually from the business sector, which we, we didn't really deal with. But <clears throat> um, I, I remember, first of all, Johnny Ballinger, who was the uh, president of First Hawaiian Bank. Mm. And what was unique about Johnny Ballinger and his time was that Johnny used to call up his friends, David Trask and Tommy Trask. And if you want to talk about unions and big business cooperating, they would get together along with uh, Willie Cannon from the Bank of Hawaii and basically uh, and uh, Chuck the old boss uh, at the uh, Hawaiian, uh, at the Hawaiian Electric. Uh, Dudley Pratt. Dudley Pratt. And basically try to set an agenda for what ought to happen politically and send their messages out to the legislature. And they sort of did that for the 1978 Constitutional Convention. And so they, they sort of put an agenda that they thought, well, it was an agenda that was opposite of what the uh, popular uh, perspective might have been about what people should talk to. So these are people who, you know, they really were Kamaianists that uh, and, and felt very strongly about Hawaii. And it's very interesting because as Native Hawaiians strive to have a more political power, you know, they ought to go back in 1970s when this was real power, you know. And the third, the last person I want to mention real quick without going into details, is another great uh, business leader, but also part of Hawaiian leader, was Kenny Brown. Mm -hmm. He was on practically every board that you could find, and he was uh, just an outstanding, uh, outstanding community leader. So. Well, you know, in addition to all the rascals and all the others, uh, we've had some really outstanding people. Well, yeah, thank you 30 years. for uh, participating in this great show. It's a real pleasure to uh, to be the guest host. Um, you've been watching Talk Story with John Waihei. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.